Okay, once again, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I only have uh, uh, one or two announcements. Um, oh, hi, Dave. Hi, Rich. <laughs> there you are. Uh, I only have one or two announcements. Uh, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center is still closed to the public. Um, although we have uh, upped our game on virtual programs and uh, some private events have actually taken place, uh, the plan is to open again to the public uh, in November. And it will be probably the last week of November. Uh, and in the meantime, between now and then, uh, Chabot and NASA Ames will be working together to refresh the exhibits at the Science Center uh, as part of the new partnership with NASA. And uh, hopefully uh, Mike Shelton will be making a, uh, a heroic effort to refurbish the facility. Uh, you know, when things sit for a couple of years, they need work. And uh, that's exactly what's happened. So I know that uh, the Spies building is under construction right now. They're redoing the entire lobby. They're getting rid of that whole front desk area uh, and changing the uh, admissions to uh, a couple of kiosks. So uh, instead of there being a desk and a counter and uh, um, uh, the ticketing the way they used to have it, they're gonna have kiosk uh, ticketing and a larger uh, rotunda area. And uh, they're also tearing out the, uh, what was the name of that exhibit downstairs where you'd walk in, it was very dark. There was a rotating planet earth. There was a couple of videos next to the bio lab. Can't you know remember. what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's called, uh, I forget what it's called. Anyway, that's all going away. So it doesn't matter what it's called because it's not gonna be there anymore. Um, and that's gonna be new exhibit space uh, for the, uh, NASA experience uh, exhibits, uh, and they're tearing out the wall to the uh, large classroom adjacent to that. That's right across from the uh, from the snack bar. So there's going to be uh, a, a large new exhibit space downstairs, and then they'll start refurbishing other parts of the center as well. So let's hope kind of a big deal. Yeah. What'd you say? I said let's hope that's not a load bearing wall. <laughs> Exactly. Well, hopefully they looked at the plants. So, uh, yeah, we won't have that problem. All right. So anyway, that was the, that, that's all the announcements I've got. Uh, please continue to uh, visit the Chabot website uh, to find out uh, uh, what programs are happening online. Um, Gerald and I are still doing virtual telescope along with John Curry and Rick Taft on Saturday nights. Right now, uh, that's at 930 uh, through the summer. And then we'll go back to nine o'clock uh, in the fall. And uh, uh, if you are so inclined, uh, make a donation to the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, they can really use the help right now. And uh, their only source of revenue is online donations right now and very small events like 10 person weddings, that type of thing. So uh, uh, in any case, if you're so inclined, please make those donations. Anyway, that's all I got for now. And I will turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Rich. Um... I want to say that uh, tonight we're really honored to have Dr. Jessie Christensen uh, speak to us. She's an astrophysicist from Caltech. Um, she's with the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, quite a mouthful there. Um, you know, I, Jessie um, is going to talk to us about truth is stranger than fiction, how science fiction planets really pale by comparison with some of the discoveries that we're making right now. And one other thing I want to say about Jessie is she has a really cool title. She is the curator of the NASA Exoplanet Archive. So she is the keeper of the exoplanets. So Jesse, I'm gonna give you as much time as uh, possible to speak. So I'll try to make this short. Jesse, Dr. Jesse Christensen, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave and Richard and everybody for having me tonight. One other um, thing I wanna say is she's a real alien, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, now I'm a resident alien, so it's all okay. Uh, uh, everyone's okay with it. So I'm going to try and share my screen again. We tested this before, so it should go well, but let's make sure it works. Um, okay. Can you see that full screen the way you expect? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. <clears throat> so hi, everybody. Yes. So I am, I am the exoplanet archivist for NASA. I keep track for NASA of how many planets we found, what they're like, anything we know about them, where they are. Um, and in my research, that's one of my hats, my research hat, I'm really interested to know 
the demographics of planets, which means how many are there and what kinds of groupings do they appear in and what kinds of stars do they occur around more often than other kinds of stars. So those are the kinds of research questions I'm trying to answer with this big population of exoplanets that we have found. Uh, so I'm very excited as the next exoplanet archive is to tell you that we've found over 4,400 planets. The official website says 4,300 something, but I just put in 12 new planets yesterday. Uh, so on Thursday, that number is going to tick over to 4,401. So you guys get a little preview. We're about to hit 4,400 exoplanets, which is pretty exciting. <clears throat> um, but tonight I want to talk about, you know, what we've been thinking about the ideas of exoplanets for a long time, for thousands of years, uh, and how that compared with what we ended up finding. So let's, so let's go on that journey tonight. Okay, so if I was, if I was doing this in a live audience, and I'm so sorry that we're on Zoom, it, you know, it's exciting that I get to talk to so many people on Zoom, but it's not the same as being there in person. So hopefully at some point I get to come up and visit you all. If I was there in person, I would ask for a show of hands, who recognizes this planet? Maybe this helps. This is Vulcan. This is Spock's homeworld, Spock from Star Trek. Uh, so this is his homeworld, homeworld Vulcan. Um, like many things in astronomy, as I'm sure you all know from looking at the sky, it had multiple names. Uh, so Vulcan, also known as Vulcan, Vulcanus A2, Navasa 2, or Forty Eridani A2. Everything in the sky has many names. So Spock, Star Trek, you know, we're talking classic sci-fi here, but actually sci-fi gets even more classic than Star Trek. <clears throat> so we've been thinking, humanity as a species has been thinking about exoplanets for a really long time. Uh, it might surprise you to realize that more than 2000 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek philosophers were talking about this idea in very abstract terms. You know, they, we didn't really understand much about the cosmology of the universe two and a half thousand years ago. But the philosophers didn't worry about that. You know, they just love tossing ideas around. And one of the things they discussed was the Earth. Was the Earth singular or plural? Would there be more Earths or could there only ever have been one true Earth? And this is the sort of thing they really like to sink their teeth into, this like metaphysical, what makes the Earth Earth? Um, so they were discussing this and Plato and Aristotle actually argued that Earth was singular, that there, were no, there was nothing out there that was truly Earth-like in, in whatever quantity you wanted to define Earth-like as. Let's jump forward. Now we're at about 1300 AD. Uh, Dante has written his Paradise Epic. Uh, and, you know, again, we're still not quite set on the cosmology yet, but we know about planets at this point. Um, and, and in his story, he has these concentric spheres where he's imagining Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, and he's telling stories on each layer, basically. So this is one of the first times we see these, these constructs. We see these planets imagined as part of someone's story. Uh, and this is like 800 years ago. This is uh, 700 and something years ago. This is a while ago. Uh, so we've been thinking about this for a long time. <clears throat> okay. Let's fast forward to the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance is a very exciting time to be in literature, in science, in art, in, in, West, in the Western world. Um, and this is a quote that I've got here from Giordano Bruno, who was an Italian mathematician. And his quote is, there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. So we have a, even more of the cosmology is set now. Now we know that planets go around stars. <clears throat> but they hadn't found anything around other stars yet. And he's just like, yeah, sure, there's planets everywhere. There's, you know, there's stars, there's planets. Um, he was actually burned at the stake for saying this because uh, the Renaissance was a good time to be a scientist, wasn't a good time to be saying things that disagree, disagreed with the Roman church. Um, so he actually was burned at the stake for, among other things, arguing for the plurality of worlds, for saying that there were planets around other stars, which was just against the doctrine of the time. <clears throat> Okay, getting back to the science fiction side of things, in the 1700s, we see a real rash of stories that include the moon, like the man in the moon, uh, aliens from the moon, lots of stories set on the moon as this fictional setting, like where you can put your imagination. In the 1800s, the focus really switches to Mars, Martians, the canals, you have all of these stories imagining what, you know, could be happening on Mars, Mars as a, as a place for fictional stories. <clears throat> okay. Now we get to the 1900s, so we're less than 100 years ago now. We've thought for a long time about planets around other stars at this point, thousands of years, but we haven't found a way to measure them yet. Otto Struve, who's an astronomer, he comes along and he's like, okay, well, 
we see two stars going around each other very easily uh, because they tug on each other a lot. They, they, the, the relative speeds that they're changing are quite high because it's two massive objects going around each other. Binary stars were well known at this point. And you could see these in the spectra of these stars. So if you take the starlight, spread it out as a function of wavelength, you can see that the two stars spectra are doing this. They're going back and forth. They're getting red shifted as the stars go away from us and blue shifted as the stars go towards us, which means the wavelengths are going back and forth like this as the stars rotate around each other. And Otto was like, okay, let's take one of those stars out and put a planet there instead. Now the change in the velocity would be much smaller because the gravitational pull of the planet on the star is much less than a star on a star. But you could conceivably still see this very small relative motion of these spectra as the star is still, it's still getting tugged around, but now by a planet instead of a star. Um, and so he, he, he writes this paper in 1952, proposing this as a technique for finding planets. Uh, and everyone, everyone basically dismisses it. They're all just like, Otto, you're crazy. You know, why would you have a planet and a star so close to each other that you could see this? So at the time we only knew of our solar system. So all of our planet formation theories were designed to recreate our solar system. If your, if your theory of how the planets formed didn't produce, you know, a set of rocky inner planets and a set of gaseous and icy outer giants, maybe some belts and clouds, then you threw it away. It was wrong because we knew what planetary systems looked like. They had inner rocky planets and outer gaseous and icy giants. So Otto was basically proposing if you took a gas giant and put it right next to the star so that it was orbiting in just a few days, which is what people saw for binary stars. Binary stars orbited each other in just a few days that you'd be able to detect that planet. And everyone was like, that's silly. Like you can't form a giant planet right next to a star. We don't see that, that's, that's never gonna work. Anyway, so between 1952 and recently- Jesse, uh, can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, sure. Forgive me, I have to say this. Otto Struva spoke to EAS. Oh, he, awesome. So just have to put that in. I'm gonna shut up now. That's nice, yay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, well, and his paper, didn't get, it got like seven citations in the next 50 years. Like everybody basically just ignored it. In science fiction, you see, uh, you see the transition from written works to, to images, to moving images. We see When Worlds Collide, one of the very first films that had a, had a, you know, a fictional planet in it. Uh, and we see, and you know, if you saw the room that I'm sitting in right now, uh, the first time that we see an exoplanet on TV, a, a fictional planet around another star, is in Doctor Who. Doctor Who travels to these amazing worlds around other stars. <clears throat> and then finally, 25 years ago, after this two and a half thousand year journey through thinking about planets around other stars, finally, 25 years ago, we found the first planet orbiting another star using the technique that Otto Struve suggested to find the kind of planet that he predicted, a gas giant orbiting its star in just a few days. Uh, we call them hot Jupiters and they were the first kind of exoplanet that we found. And now we know of hundreds of them. The gas giants that orbit their star in just two or three days, they're heated up to thousands of degrees. Uh, so that's, you know, that's wild. So since then, since that 25 years ago, his paper's been cited over a hundred times. Um, so, you know, just, to, just goes to show you, you publish your idea, maybe it'll pan out at some point. <clears throat> so now we have found over 4,000 exoplanets since then. So as I said, my job is to put these planets into NASA's Exoplanet Archive. Uh, and as I also said, um, stars have lots of names. Um, so here's a page that I put in a few years ago now for a new planet orbiting the star HD 26965. Now this is a pr pretty bright star. So it has a bunch of aliases. It's in a bunch of different catalogs. There's a two mass name, there's a BD, there's a, Gisa, a, Gleesa, a there's a Gleesa name, there's a HD name, there's a HIP name, there's all these different names. As I'm putting in all these aliases, I see this one and I'm like, Forty Eridani. And that kind of like just scratches, like record scratch in my brain. I'm like, Forty, er why do I know Forty Eridani? And I didn't, I couldn't quite work it out. I just kind of kept going, but I was, it just was in the back of my mind, like, Forty Eridani, why is that familiar? Eventually, I had to Google. I, I admit I couldn't just recall the fact to mind immediately. Forty Eridani is the system where Vulcan is situated in Star Trek. So the planet that I showed right at the start, orbiting Forty Eridani A, it, uh, we have found in real life a planet orbiting that star. So this is the system. Forty Eridani is actually a triple system. So you have Forty Eridani A, and then orbited at a large distance by this binary B and C. So there really is a Forty Eridani A. 
this is real star. Um, and we really have found a planet around it. It's unfortunately not very Vulcan-like, the planet that we found. Uh, it's, it's a giant planet. It's not a, it's not a rocky planet like Vulcan's home world. But one of the things we have found is that planetary systems are often well populated. Uh, often there's many, many planets in them. Um, it's rare that you just find planets on their own. So the fact that we found a planet around this star means there's likely other planets and some of them might be rocky. So we may yet find <laughs> Spock's home world, Vulcan, uh, around 40 Eridania A. So that's just kind of neat. <clears throat> so we haven't found it yet, but maybe. Uh, this is Kepler 62F, which is the most Vulcan-like planet we have found so far in terms of its size and distance from the star and the type of star that it orbits. That's just a bit of a Easter egg, <clears throat> Kepler 62F. But that inspired me. Um, and so for a Star Trek convention that I went to a few years ago, I went through this rather lengthy exercise. Um, there's a website called Mem Memory Alpha Wiki, which basically contains every fact that Star Trek has ever, you know, put to pen or paper or screen. Um, and one of the things they have is a list of all of the planets that have ever been to. Um, so up until Discovery, so this doesn't include, for the, for the Star Trek pedants out there, this doesn't include Lower Decks and it doesn't include Picard. Up to Discovery, there are 938 planets um, that get visited, uh, have been visited over the various movies and TV shows. <clears throat> Of those, I went through uh, all of them and I found that 51 of them orbited stars that I could recognize or at least attempt to create the real name of. Some of them were just like, you know, instead of Alpha Taurus, it was Taurus Alpha. And I'm like, okay, I'll accept that. I'll, I'll accept that I know what star that is. Um, so there were 51 real stars that had these fictional Star Trek planets around them. Seven of those stars in real life so far have been found to host planets. So it turns out that the 40 Eridani thing is not quite so much of a fluke as I originally thought. It's actually happening fairly, fairly commonly. Uh, one system I wanted to talk about that we found is Tau Ceti. Um, so Tau Ceti uh, in real life has four planets around it, um, at least four. This is... This one's a bit of a complicated system where there were three and then there were seven and then now there's four. Uh, we're still kind of deciding. Sometimes the signals can be hard. If there's many planets, it's hard to disentangle their signatures from each other. Uh, but right now it has four. Um, now Tau Ceti, of course, is a bright star. Uh, it's got one of those Greek letter alphabet names. So it's pretty bright. So here it is. This is the constellation Cetus. So Tau Ceti is this one in the bottom left. It's naked eye. You can go out and see it. And I hope you get the chance to. <clears throat> Uh, and the exciting thing is in the Star Trek universe, it also has four planets. Um, so it's four planets in the Star Trek universe and four planets in real life so far. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, here are the four real life planets, G, H, E, and F. Now I'm gonna apologize right now for how we name our planets because it's very boring and very frustrating. Um, so these are the names of these planets are Tau Ceti, G, H, E, and F. <laughs> so we start with the name of the star and then we start adding little letters with every planet that we find. So the first planet is little b and then little c and then little d. Now, remember how I said this one kind of has a complicated history. B, C, and D, the original three planets have since been refuted and said they, those planets aren't real, but E, F, G, and H are real. So that's why this system is weird. But anyway, what I wanted to show here, I'm getting sidetracked because I know you like the details of how we do things. What I'm showing here is a schematic of the inner solar system around our sun, and then a schematic of the inner solar system around Tau Ceti. This green shaded region here uh, is what we call the habitable zone. Um, so that's where the temperature is right for liquid water. Um, if, if you had the right conditions with the right atmosphere, you could potentially have liquid water on the surface. So one of the exciting things about Tau Ceti is there's two planets that are pretty close to the habitable zone. So depending on their actual atmospheres and surface gravities of the planets, they might be habitable. Um, they're right on the edge. Uh, and they're actually, these, the planet sizes is to scale. They're actually quite a bit bigger than Earth. So the surface gravity would be very high, <clears throat> something like eight times the size of Earth. Um, so if you could imagine if you weighed eight times as much, <clears throat> I mean, that's how I feel some mornings, but you know, this might be different. So, you know, they, it could be habitable, but we're not actually, we're not actually sure. So we'll just go with it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. If it is habitable, they don't, they don't look like us. <clears throat> All right, skipping, skipping franchises somewhat. Um, let's talk about Doctor Who. Uh, some of my favorite fictional planets are from Doctor Who. Uh, Doctor Who has imagined some incredibly wild and wonderful places. 
But let's talk about where Doctor Who has gone. If you had a box such as the one I'm sitting in that could go anywhere in time and space, where would you spend most of your time? Yeah, Doctor Who spends most of their time on Earth, um, which, you know, when you actually look at the statistics, it's like, I understand why, but still a little, you know, frustrating. Like, oh, we could, we could do so much more with that. <clears throat> uh, about a fifth of the time, Doctor Who spends on a planet that is functionally Earth-like. It's basically just, we went to a different part of Earth and we're just giving it a different name. Um, a bunch of the time they're on an Earth-ish planet, which is basically like we put a purple filter in front, but it's still basically rocks and air and it's breathable and, you know, it's fine. Still, So, you know, fully 80% of the planets that Doctor Who has gone to are just the Earth uh, or some color corrected version thereof. Sometimes Doctor Who has gone to genuinely uninhabitable places. Uh, so this little screenshot in the bottom right is from one of my favorite episodes called Midnight, uh, where the David Tennant Doctor Who goes to this crystalline planet, which has this uh, ionizing radiation, which means you can't go outside. So the, the whole point of the episode is like a bottle episode. They get trapped in this shuttle uh, because you can't go outside of the shuttle uh, because it's, it's uninhabitable. And that's like genuinely a cool, interesting idea, this crystalline planet. Uh, some of the episodes are just in space. Uh, you know, you visit a spaceship or something, dinosaurs in space, for instance. And then there is a very small number where they go to something truly different, like a black hole or an asteroid belt or some other quite interesting thing, like a nebula. Um, but most of the time, 80% of the time, Doctor Who is just going to something kind of like Earth, uh, which if you do the statistics, kind of a bit of a downer. Uh, and I do want to shout out here to my colleague, JJ Eldridge, uh, who is the one who actually put this together. Uh, she did all the statistics and I just made the pie chart. <clears throat> so let's talk about that crystalline planet though. Uh, so midnight, a crystal planet with ionizing radiation. We have actually found a planet that could be at least in part crystalline. Um, this is 55 Cancri E. So 55 Cancri E is a rocky planet that orbits incredibly close to its star, has a very short period of a day or so. Um, and what happens to a rock when you put it right next to something very large and very hot is that it melts. Um, one of the things we've been able to measure about 55 Cancri E is that it has a very high carbon content compared to, for instance, the Earth's solid material. And what happens to carbon when you put it under incredible pressure, like the tidal forces being right next to a star and heated up, turns into a diamond. Uh, so there's a prediction that this planet uh, in one of its layers, you know, how we have like the core and the mantle, um, in one of the layers of 55 Cancri E, there's like literally a crystalline diamond layer uh, where carbon is basically probably in some form we don't see on earth, but you know, crystalline carbon, we'll call it diamond to be fun. Um, because of this heat and pressure that it's under. So there are actually potentially crystalline planets out there. Uh, the surface of this planet is molten though, so not exactly like midnight, um, but still pretty wild. Uh, so that's our midnight equivalent. Another classic planet from Doctor Who is Gallifrey. Um, Gallifrey is, is Doctor Who's home world and the master. This is where, this is where the Time Lords come from. Uh, although with the later season, now we don't know where the Time Lords come from. Um, messing with the whole mythology. But the point is you can see that a, there's a planet with a red sky and it's got two stars and it's got multiple planets around it, three planets in the Gallifrey system. Uh, and we have actually found uh, this exact configuration. This is Kepler 47. Uh, I'll talk about Kepler in just a minute. Um, but this is a, this is a system. Uh, Kepler 47 has two stars uh, in the center orbited by three planets. Uh, none of them are likely rocky, but as I said, there might be more planets that are rocky. Um, but we have actually found this very cool Gallifrey config configuration. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about Kepler. How did we get from one planet in 1995 to 4,400 planets today? In large part, that was because of NASA's Kepler mission. Uh, so Kepler was a spacecraft that launched in 2009. Uh, operated for four years before it had some equipment failures, which was, you know, if you have equipment failures in space, that's kind of a bummer because you can't really fix it. Um, but it spent four years looking at one patch of sky in the constellation Cygnus, uh, looking for planets like the Earth. The goal of Kepler was to work out how common planets like the Earth were. And by planets like the Earth, I mean rocky planets, so solid surface, in the habitable zone, so that green shaded region that I showed before, so where you could have liquid water on the surface, 
of a star like the sun. Uh, so just a boring middle-aged 5,000 degree G star um, of which the galaxy has plenty. <clears throat> so that was what we were looking for. We didn't find one. What did we find? Uh, we spent four years finding all sorts of interesting new things uh, that we hadn't expected. Um, one of them was Kepler 20e, which is actually the first lava world. So these are these rocky worlds that are so close to their star that they're molten. These are just like balls of magma floating in space because they're so hot. Um, they're orbiting, you know, in just hours or, or like a very small number of days. Uh, we were looking for this. And this was the kind of the progress we made towards that. We found rocky planets around slightly cooler stars. We found this one, Kepler 22b. So you can see these planets are actually to scale. On this figure, the planets are to scale with each other and the stars are to scale with each other, but the stars and the planets are not to scale. Um, so this is Kepler 22. It's about 2.2 times the radius of Earth. So it's pretty big. It's between the size of Earth and Neptune. So this is one of the first super Earths that we found. Uh, and it turns out, so, you know, I said I'm interested in demographics. It seems like the most common kind of planet that we have found is one of these super Earths. Uh, so something between the size of Earth and Neptune. So in our solar system, there's a real clear size difference, right? We've got the four rocky planets and then the four giants. And there's a big gap in between. So you've got to jump from one times the size of the Earth to four times the size of the Earth for Neptune. And there's nothing in between. And again, if your planet formation theories couldn't create that, then you went back to the drawing board. And it turns out it looks like the most common kind of planet in our galaxy is not something we have in our solar system. It's a super Earth. It's a larger planet than Earth, smaller than Neptune. So now there's a lot of hubbub about that because that, what does that mean? Are they big rocks? Are they small ice giants? Are they something we don't have like a water world? Uh, when we looked at the density of Kepler 22b, it has the average density of water. Like the bulk density of this planet is basically the same as water. Um, that's super interesting. We don't have something like a, a genuine water world in our solar system. Uh, so Kepler 22b was our first, like one of these really interesting super Earths. Kepler 186f um, was the first thing that we really genuinely thought might be habitable. So it's the same size as Earth, so we think it's rocky. Uh, it's the right distance from the star to have the temperature of liquid water. But you can see the star, this little star is actually much smaller and cooler and redder than our sun. It's actually an M dwarf. And now there's more, the, the galaxy is like 75% M dwarfs. Uh, so that's not uncommon, but M dwarfs actually put out very different radiation to our sun. Um, so they're cooler, but actually they put out a lot of their energy as high energy radiation, like X-rays and UV, which is bad for life. We try to avoid X-rays and UV when we can. Um, so the fact that we found this planet, which is in the habitable zone of this star is kind of, a, is a mystery. We actually don't know whether planets around M dwarfs can be habitable because of all of this high energy radiation. Maybe they're all just completely sterilized by the proximity to the star. And you know, nothing, nothing with our kind of like DNA based structure could, could live there. Uh, we don't know, this is an active area of study right now. Then the last thing that we found before we had our equipment failures was Kepler 452b. <clears throat> so this is the right kind of star. Now we're back to a sun-like star. It's the right distance for liquid water. It's a little big, it's about one and a half times the size of Earth, which is basically where we start to get unsure whether it's truly rocky or whether it's got a very large, deep, gaseous or icy atmosphere. Um, so that, that's a little bit disconcerting. The problem with Kepler 452b is that it might not be there. Um, the data are really ratty. Uh, and if it's a real planet, that's great. If it's noise, it's hard to tell. It could just be noise, uh, which would be a little bit of a shame. Um, so that's as close as we've gotten. We tried really hard with Kepler for many years to find something like a true Earth twin, a true like Caprica or Beta Z or something that genuinely just looks like blue and green bowl with breathable air in space. And we did not find it. Um, so that'll be left for another NASA mission to come. But that doesn't mean we didn't find some really cool stuff on the way. So this is, let's go back to Kepler 10c. Uh, Kepler 10, this is this rocky planet that's a lava world. Um, which, you know, if you look for examples in sci-fi, we have Mustafa, uh, which is where Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan have their big, you know, Anakin, I have the high ground um, uh, fight. And then this is like the genesis of Darth Vader, right? Um, so this is, you know, this is the equivalent. This is a, this is a lava world. This, this would 100% be erupting and bubbling lava in the background. So this is Kepler 22b. This is our super earth slash water world. 
Um, so we actually nicknamed that one Kevin um, because, you know, Waterworld, Kevin Costner. Uh, and this is interesting. Like, do we, are there true water worlds out there? Are there true planets that could just genuinely be covered in deep oceans of water? Uh, when we think about our solar system, we believe that the water on Earth was delivered by comets in the outer solar system. So when the solar system was forming, it was a lot busier than it is now, stuff going everywhere. There were lots of comets coming in and comets are very icy. They start in the outer region of the solar system where it's cool enough for ices to form. Uh, and they deliver all of this water to Earth over hundreds of millions of years. Now, if you think about it, this is a kind of an interesting thing to think about. Earth has an interesting amount of water, right? There wasn't enough water to delivered to cover the entire surface of Earth and have an entire water world ocean deep. But there wasn't so little water that it just evaporated away. There was the right amount of water to cover some goodly amount of the planet uh, and enough to stay. And that's just already interesting. Like if you think about the fine tuning that has to happen for the amount of water you could deliver such that today, four billion years later, you have oceans. That's really interesting. Uh, anyway, so we don't know if water worlds exist, but we have found planets to just have the density of water. Um, so we want to find out more about those. Uh, here's our Kepler-186f, which is our rocky planet in the habitable zone of an M dwarf. Do we see these in science fiction? Yes. In fact, that is Superman's homeworld, Krypton. Superman comes from a rocky planet around an M dwarf. And the whole point is when he comes to our star, our yellow star, the change in radiation gives him powers. Um, so, you know, then it would be like, well, what would happen if we went to an M star? Either we would die because of all of the high energy radiation, or maybe we would get superpowers. Um, so not quite, well, not quite at a habitable Earth yet, but maybe a superpowered Earth. And then finally, this is Kepler 452b. This is our mystery planet, you know, he toss a coin, heads it's real, tails it's not. We think it really has a genuinely 50-50 chance of being real. If it's real, it may be habitable. And this may be our best chance of having a habitable planet. And this would be your like Beta Z or your Caprica. This would be your, you know, happy blue ball in space. Uh, but we don't know yet. There's a few different ways we're going to try to confirm it. For instance, Hubble, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope may be able to confirm it. Uh, we just, they, they just need to give us time. And, you know, the classic problem with Hubble is getting time. Um, so yeah, we're not, we haven't found the Earth twin yet. All of these science fiction imaginings of, Earth-like planets out there, uh, we haven't found one. It's not that we don't believe they're out there, it's just that we haven't found one yet. Okay, we have found a real, real diversity of things. Some of them will have matches with science fiction, some of them don't. This one is the classic. Um, this one is Tatooine. This is Luke Skywalker's homeworld. Now we're jumping back over to Star Wars. Uh, and this is a scene from New Hope and he's got these two sons. This is George Lucas. This is the 70s. This is two decades before we've even found exoplanets. And he's like, oh yeah, let's just have two suns in that sky. That's great. Uh, and then the very first circumbinary planet, we call them circumbinaries. They're planets that go around binary stars. The very first circumbinary planet, Kepler-16, is orbiting two stars, a yellow star and a red star. He even got the colors right right? Like it's a yellow star and a red star and a yellow star and a red star. He didn't get the sizes right, but you know, again, not an actual astrophysicist. So I'll give him a little bit of leeway, but 20 years before we'd even discovered planets and he's out there just like, oh yeah, yellow star, red star, let's do it. That's so cool. Um, oh, this one I wanted to talk about a little bit. So one of the techniques that we use to find planets, there's many techniques we use now. We've moved on from Otto, but we still use the radial velocity technique, which is what it's called. One of the techniques that we use, microlensing, is actually very sensitive to far away planets. Almost all of the techniques we have are sensitive to nearby planets, just because of being able to look at the stars more easily. Microlensing is actually sensitive to very, very distant planets. So this is Ogle 2015 BLG 0051b. And again, I'm sorry about the names. This is a planet that's 26,000 light years away towards the center of the galaxy. And we're actually only 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. So this is, you know, 85% of the way there towards the center of the galaxy. Um, this is a cold gas giant orbiting far from its star, orbiting far from us. Um, so to jump franchises again, uh, Vormir is the planet from the Marvel Universe, which is called the center of celestial existence, and it's a desolate, distant planet. Uh, so this is as close as we get uh, to Vormir 
in the real world is Ogle 2015 BLG0051B. Um, and I do have that written down. I don't have that memorized because that's a pain. All the microlensing planets have rubbish long names. Uh, so that's Vormir. This is, this is, we get in the Marvel fans here. Um, okay. Another classic uh, sci-fi uh, dune. Uh, uh, have we found something like Arrakis? So uh, in, the, in the actual books, uh, Arrakis is orbiting Canopus, the star Canopus. We haven't found anything around Canopus yet. Canopus is a red giant. We have found planets orbiting red giants. Um, it's much more difficult to find planets around giant stars just because the way we find planets are almost all reliant on changes to the star that the planet induces. So if the star is even bigger than, it, you know, already there's a huge differential between a planet and a star. And if it's a giant star, that just makes it much worse. Uh, but we have found some planets orbiting red giants. Um, and those are really interesting. Like, how did they survive? Like one day our sun will be a red giant. You know, will we get swallowed up? Will our orbit change? What will happen? Will Mars become habitable? These are all things we're thinking about with red giants. And that's why it's exciting when we find these things in real life, because we might be seeing the future of our solar system. What's going to happen to us in 5 billion years? If we can find planets around red giants today, we can learn like which planets survive and which planets get swallowed up and, you know, what actually happens to the orbital configuration of the planets. Uh, that's why, you know, we're kind of like looking into our own future. One of the things we found, which is actually very rare in science fiction, I haven't found lot, I haven't found like a good example. One of the things we found are very compact systems of resonant planets. So we see resonances in our solar system, right? So the Galilean moons around Jupiter, there's a one to two to four resonance with three of the moons. Uh, Neptune and Pluto are in a three to two resonance. So for every three times Neptune goes around, Pluto goes around twice. Um, so we, we see some resonances in our solar system, but in science fiction, it's, it's a rare, or at least I haven't found a good example of these like compact systems of planets that are super close to each other and they're locked in these resonances. Um, so there's the, the movie with, uh, is it Vin Diesel? I'm going to say Vin Diesel, but I'm going to be wrong. Um, where the stars and the planet, there's like a binary star and a planet or a triple star and a planet that have periodic things that happen. But having these actual planets in a resonant chain is really interesting. This is a graphic of TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 you might have heard of. This is seven rocky planets that were found orbiting an M dwarf. Uh, this star is basically as small as you can get and still be a star. It's 8% the size of the sun. And if it was 7.8% the size of the sun, it would be too small to be a star. Uh, so this is as small as you can get and still like have enough gravity uh, in the middle to start burning hydrogen into deuterium. Um, and, and helium. So this is a very small star, but it's got seven planets around it. And three of them, we believe, are in the, are in the habitable zone of that star. Um, but the thing is, their periods are all related to each other of these planets in this chain of seven resonances in a row. Um, so they're all related to each other by integer period ratios, um, which is very, very cool and very interesting. One of the reasons it's interesting is it because it tells us something about the formation history of this system. When we're thinking about how our solar system formed, we're trying to re recreate like how it looked when it started versus how it looks now. What moved? What changed? Did everything just start where it ended up? Or was there migration? Was there evolution? Uh, you know, there are, there are models of the solar system where the giant planets migrate in uh, and create this big disturbance and then migrate out again. Um, there, there are models where Jupiter and Saturn switch places. There are models where there's five giant planets and one of them gets kicked out of the solar system to become a rogue planet out in the galaxy. So there's lots of different dynamics that can happen. But some of those theories don't work with a chain of resonant planets. Like if you have a really stochastic system where planets are just, you know, ricocheting off each other, gravitationally speaking, not really hitting each other, but they're like interchanging energy and eccentricity uh, and like kicking each other out of the system. You can't end up with this like super closely packed set of resonant planets. It just doesn't work. You can't end up, you know, dissipating your energy in that way. One of the only ways you can do this is if the planets are migrating while the protoplanetary disk of gas and material is still there, because that acts like a torque on the planets, like a, a change in momentum. It's like they're trying to go through molasses because there's all this gas and dust around um, and that changes their energy. 
And what you get is these planets kind of migrate together through the disk. And when they get into resonance, they kind of lock each other in resonance. And those two planets migrate and then lock a third planet in resonance. And then they migrate and lock a fourth planet in. This is all very like slow and smooth in order to end up with these planets all tightly packed together. Um, and again, this is just something that we hadn't really predicted and hadn't really, you know, fantasized about even in fiction very much. Um, so this is like a cool thing that nature seems to do is to create these tightly packed systems of many planets. Uh, so we have a number of examples now. And one I wanted to talk about sort of getting towards the end of the talk now uh, is K2138. So K2138 is a K star. So this is a, like an orange star between a yellow G star and a red M star. It's a K star with at least six planets around it. And this, this figure here shows five of them. And they're in a chain of three to two resonances. So for every three times the inner one goes around, the next one goes around twice. For every three times that one goes around, the next one goes around twice and all the way out. So it's this chain, unbroken chain of three to two resonances. Part of the reason it was cool is because it was found by people like you. It was found by citizen scientists. It was found just by interested people at home on their computers looking through the Kepler data um, and, and finding this system, um, which I was lucky enough to get to publish and include some of the citizen scientists on the paper. Um, so that was really exciting to get to discover this like really interesting compact resonance system. Um, Oh, one thing I didn't check was whether sound would work. So I'll try this. And Dave, if, if you don't hear anything in a few seconds, then uh, just tell me it's not working. One of the things that's interesting about, I'm not, I haven't started playing it. I'll start playing in a second. One of the things that's interesting is these three to two resonances. In music, the three to two interval is the perfect fifth chord. That's like in the tonic chord in Western music theory is a perfect fifth. So you can actually make music out of this system. So let me see if this works. Okay, can you hear it, Dave? Not hearing anything yet. Okay, I didn't check that the sound would work. I think there's a separate thing I have to check. I will send you guys a link afterwards to this very cool video. Um, and basically it just shows, like I'll play it, you can't hear it, but I'll just show you what it shows. Every time a planet goes in front of the star, it makes a note and the note plays a song because the chords are all perfect. They're all perfect fifths. Um, it it kind of sounds like if you put twinkle twinkle in a blender. Um, and so this was, uh, a, there are still ongoing citizen science projects. Um, planethunters.org is the one that's currently going. I don't know if it has live data at the moment. We upload data to it as we get new data down from the spacecrafts. Um, but that's where you would go if you wanted to help out and maybe find you know, a new type of system that we haven't seen before and get your name on a paper in the future. Uh, so that's planethunters.org. Go and help us find planets. So Kepler ended up dying, you know, the reaction wheels failed. We did a bit more science with what we had left and then the fuel ran out in 2018. But in 2018, we launched our current planet hunter. So this is TESS. This is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite because everything in astronomy is an acronym. So this is the TESS mission. Um, so where Kepler was a one meter telescope that looked at one patch of sky for four years, TESS is four 10 centimeter telescopes. That's these four telescopes you see right here. That's four inches. You guys have bigger telescopes at home. I'm sure of it. Um, but you get so much advantage when you go to space, right? You get above the atmosphere and you can just stare for as long as you want. So TESS is doing the whole sky with these four 10 centimeter telescopes, looking for planets around all the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, and it's predicted to find something like 16,000 planets. So I said at the start, we have 4,000 planets right now. Uh, so TESS you know, if it lives up to our expectations, we'll quintuple our current yield of planets. And I'm really excited about that, not just because I like the demographics and, you know, more planets means I can ask more questions about which types of planets are more common, uh, but also because it gives us a chance to discover more crazy, wild, new worlds. Uh, you know, it's fun to find the ones that we've thought about. Like, it's fun to find Vulcan. It's fun to find Gallifrey. But what's really fun is finding the things that no one thought of, right? That the, finding a system that hadn't ever occurred to anybody before. You know, finding the hot Jupiters that uh, Otto Struve predicted, that was amazing. Um, but I love finding the things that no one predicted. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what comes out of TESS uh, and what comes out of the citizen scientists and you guys. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the talk and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dave. Oh, thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. Um, I've got uh, a uh, technical question first, and then we can get into some uh, questions about science fiction planets. Um, uh, can you explain microlensing? 
Oh, I can try. Um, it's general relativity. So I think only Einstein could truly explain it. Okay. How microlensing works is you look at a background screen of stars, like the center of the Milky Way has is super crowded, right? It's a very dense screen of stars. So you observe this screen of stars and you're basically just measuring the brightness of these stars over and over again. What you're waiting for is for something between us and the center of the galaxy, so another star, to go in front of one of the background stars. What happens then, because of the ratios of the distances, everything has everything with mass bends space time, right? You remember the bowling ball on the rubber sheet analogy. Everything with mass bends space time. So this star that comes between us and the background stars is bending space time. It's bending light around it, and it acts like a magnifying glass on those background stars. Uh, um, okay. So what you see, if you're measuring the measuring the brightness of the light over and over, what you see is this very characteristic shape of the background star gets brighter, 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 fainter, fainter, fainter. And it's this very specific curve because it's just this curving of space time is described by relativity. It's very symmetric. Uh, very occasionally, you'll see this curve and then you'll see a blip. Uh, and that is that happens if the star that goes between us and the background star has a planet around it because the planet does its own little mini curve of space time, much smaller, um, but it does its own little short mini curving of space time. Um, so basically you're measuring the brightness of these stars and you're looking for these lensing events. And then once you find the lensing events, you're looking for little perturbations to see like, oh, does it have a planet around it? Well, that's fantastic because, you know, obviously that's very similar to gravitational lensing for uh, galaxies, but in fact, you're studying the reverse. Because yeah. uh, with gravitational lensing, you're studying the farther object by taking advantage of the closer object to bend space time. And in your case, this right. is uh, doing the exact reverse of that. Yeah. And spread, it's essentially sp uh, spreading out the wave function so you could uh, see that blip more easily. Because if you were just trying to see the occultation, in front of a tiny star would be very, very, very difficult. But now you've got it more spread out. And you yeah, would see so that it's called, light. It's, yeah, yeah, it's the Einstein radius. So it's actually yes. much larger than the star. Um, and it's one of the things that helps us do this. That's fascinating. All we right, often, thank you. We, don't, we often don't even see the intervening star. Um, we only ever see the background star because the, the background screen of like giant stars is quite luminous, but it's probably just an M dwarf you know, 10,000 light years away. So it's super faint. We don't see it, but we see its magnification of the background star. Wow, very cool. So yeah, when you were talking about water worlds, uh, moving on to, to other things, when you were talking about water worlds, the first thing I thought of was the movie Interstellar, which I don't know if you saw that oh, or yeah, not, yeah, yeah. but that had, that had a great depiction of an all water world where they uh, where you know, they thought there was a mountain in the background, but it turned out to be a giant tidal wave. <laughs> but yeah, it was like, yeah. oh, oops. And uh, I, I thought that that was a, a, a very good depiction compared to some of the others that they had in that movie. But, yeah, that's something we haven't found yet is a planet around uh -huh. a black hole. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Right. right. But Speaking about um, uh, uh, unusual things to orbit around, the other planet um, I was thinking about was uh, the planet from the three body problem by uh, Liu Shixin mm -hmm. and uh, Chinese science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And that is a planet that's kind of a desert planet, but it is in orbit around a triple star system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was curious, have there been any findings of planets that actually are in orbit? Or, uh, you found double star systems with planets right. orbiting it. Mm -hmm. And you did mention the Vulcan uh, yes. uh, planet, which is associated with a triple star mm -hmm. system, but it was in orbit around one, I guess, one of those stars. I guess that's the closest thing. That, yeah, that so, we found. yeah. Right. So, I mean, part of the premise of the book is that the three body problem is not a solved closed analytic problem, right? It's, right. it's difficult to get a stable orbit with three bodies where they're truly all orbiting each other. So what we, what we see in nature instead are these, what we call hierarchical triples, where you have a binary of two very close stars and then a third star that's quite far away mm, because I they see. can treat each other like two point sources, basically, because they're far ah. enough away. Um, so what we see is either planet, planets either orbit very far away from binary stars so that they're far enough away that, again, they can just treat that central binary like a point source. Or if there's two stars that are separated quite far, then the planet orbits close to one of the stars so that it can effectively ignore the faraway star. 
we don't see examples of planets orbiting three stars because the three star solution isn't stable, which is part of the fun of the book. Great. Dave, did people send in uh, any planets to you that they, uh, they did anybody they, respond to you? They sent in a bunch of planets, but we run into the same problem that Jesse mentioned with regard to Doctor Who, which is so many uh, planets are class M planets, Captain. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's a uh, and so there's, you know, it's funny because uh, actually humans have less imagination than the universe has. Yeah, that's the, um, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. That's the title of the talk, right? We spend a lot of time imagining that everything will look kind of Earth-like and then it really yeah. doesn't. <laughs> and, and, and all the solar systems look just like ours. And yeah, exactly. What happened? Um, so that's why I really appreciate these moments of creativity when like, you know, when George Lucas is out there like, yeah, let's put two stars in there. Uh, you know, the, and then, you know, we find them and they're like, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> uh, Jesse, what is the best website to observe the number of planets that's, uh, that's have been discovered? Because I often get questions in my programs, how many plan extrasolar planets have we discovered? And I want to be able to say, not only this is the number, but here's the website you should go to. Sure. So um, the public facing website of the archive is JPL's Eyes on Exoplanets. JPL eyes on exoplanets yes so if you google jpl eyes on exoplanets you'll find it so that's like a, a pretty front-facing public website that has like nice graphs and has the number always updated gives you a breakdown by like jupiter size and earth size and stuff great the underlying database under that is the nasa exoplanet archive and we have a separate like if you google nasa exoplanet archive you'll find us but our website is not like pretty and our, our website is just boring tables for astronomers to use <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think your 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 uh, example there of Forty Eridani was boring at all. I didn't realize it had all, the, all those many names. Well, the star had all yeah. those many names. Oh, and Very that's boring. our old overview pages. We actually just like six months ago rolled out much prettier overview pages, but it's harder to see the uh, aliases because most of the time they're not it's not actually useful information. So we hid them a bit. Um, so now it's, I can't update that slide to show our new overviews because it doesn't make my cool Forty Eridani point anymore. Couple of uh, questions from Facebook. Um, Bronwyn asked, um, when you are using, I'm, 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 edit, I'm editorializing a bit. Um, I think when she's talking about using uh, land-based telescopes to detect exoplanets, because in space, this wouldn't apply. Uh, when using land-based telescopes to detect exoplanets, how do they correct for uh, 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 atmospheric uh, pollution and atmospheric uh, turbulence uh, when you are studying uh, the uh, changes in uh, in brightness of a star and looking at transits or even looking at um, uh, uh, the small redshifts. Um, yeah, no, I method. mean, this is this is what I spent my entire PhD doing is working out how to do this. The trick is changes in brightness that are happening because of our atmosphere are usually happening to a bunch of stars at the same time in the same uh -huh. part of the sky. So what you do is you measure the brightness of all of the stars nearby to the star that you care about. And any, any changes, because you know, you also get these changes in, in air mass, like the amount of atmosphere you're going through. Like if you're looking towards the horizon, you're actually going through a longer amount of atmosphere than if you're looking straight overhead. Um, and then the atmosphere itself is changing temperature. It's turbulent, as Roman points out. Um, so, but the turbulence is affecting, you know, a number of stars. So what you want to do is find the things that happen in common to all the stars and then take that out, correct that out. Got and it. What, whatever's unique to your star should have only happened to that star and shouldn't be caused by the atmosphere. That's the trick. That makes perfect sense. So it's kind of like a subtraction of the variance. Exactly. That so, and yeah, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of tricks to like, you know, different colored stars will be changed in different ways by the atmosphere. So, you know, right. there's a bunch of yeah. corrections you do, but the basics is the atmosphere affects all the stars in the same part of the sky. So you try and correct for it. That's great cool. answer. Great answer. Yeah. All right. Uh, another unusual question here, uh, or, or, or usual question. It wasn't unusual. It's the usual question um, is, is there a particular planet in your catalog that people consider the most Earth-like? Or yeah, the so, most, yeah, the most, the most likely to support some kind of carbon-based life. 
Yeah, so if it's real, Kepler 452B. Um, okay. So it's still, it's still in our catalogue. We just have it flagged as controversial because there were a few papers that came out that were like, meh, it's, we're not as confident in that as I think you should be um, uh, to call something a planet. So we have it in. It's marked controversial. Um, and then Kepler 186F is the other one I brought up. That's the one that's a rocky planet at the right distance from an M dwarf that we're not sure about. So one of the exciting discoveries of Kepler is that rocky planets in the habitable zones of M dwarfs are incredibly common. We think every M dwarf has one or more rocky planets in the habitable zone, just everywhere. Now, considering the fact that 75% of the stars in the galaxy are M dwarfs, that's an incredible amount of habitable rocky real estate in the galaxy if they're habitable orbiting M dwarfs. So that's like one of the big unanswered questions right now. And there's a lot of astrobiologists working on like what, what, what's the error budget? What's the energy budget? What, what chemical gradients could you still work with if you had all of this X-ray activity? Jesse, you said that all of the M-class stars uh, have this radiation pattern that tends to sterilize planets, correct? Uh, they all have high, they all have a higher fraction of their energy come out in the form of X-ray and UVs. Some of them are very active as well and have these huge flares. Um, so for instance, Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to our sun, has a rocky planet around it uh, and flares occasionally. And the thing is these flares put out like another million times as much energy again. Um, and so one of the questions is, if you had a quiet M star that didn't have, that didn't flare very often, maybe that's your niche. Like the very flaring stars, you know, we use UV lamps to sterilize things here on earth because they're yes. so effective. Um, so I have the, out my fish pond, but anyway, that's another story. Yes. So the problem is, yeah, if they're too active, then they're probably unlikely. But so the question is, are there quiet enough M stars? So that's what we're working on right now. One other possibility that I want to raise is the Pandora possibility, which is that you may have gas giants orbiting in the habitable zone, and they may have moons that are, in fact, habitable, you know, somewhat smaller than the Earth. When will we be able to discover pl uh, planets or moons, in quotes, like that? Yeah, so we have one good candidate right now for an exomoon. Um, so that's Kepler 1625bi. So B being the planet and I, little Roman numeral I, being the first moon found around the first planet in, in the Kepler 1625 system. Um, it's not a rocky planet. If it's, if it's real, it's like a Neptune-sized planet around a Jupiter-sized planet. So it's more like a binary planet system like Pluto Charon or something. Um, but it's the, first, it's the first likely candidate we have. Um, even with Kepler, which was like exquisite photometry for four years straight, you know, think about how hard planets are to find. Moons are just another order of magnitude more difficult to find again. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so we're not there yet. Um, there's, protect, there's prospects in the future, and we have this one candidate, but we're not there yet. All right, got a, a couple more questions, but I was doing a quick search to see whether I could find the answer before I asked it to you and I haven't been able to yet. So uh, Frank is asking some really good uh, sci-fi questions here and I can't mm -hmm. believe he asked a Dune question that I couldn't answer because I've read the book so many times. Uh, did Frank Herbert make Canopus a red giant in Dune? I vaguely recall it being a blue giant, which is very interesting. Oh. I'm really wondering if he did that because I can't can't remember that yeah I don't all. I don't remember the specifics of what kind of giant he called it to be honest I think well, I guess we'll have to wait we'll for the next to go, movie to find out <laughs> yeah we all just have to go reread our copies of June and, and be like is it a, is it what kind of color giant is it um well, he in real up, life it's a red yeah. giant yeah, in real life, it is a red giant. And I was looking through the uh, various fan sites on Dune to see if there was anything that talked about the, the uh, spectrum of the star that uh, Arrakis mm -hmm. orbited, and I can't find anything yet. Um, he asked, he followed up a uh, second question. Have you read uh, Sylvia Engdahl's The Planet Girded Suns and the Cambridge three-volume history of ideas about little green men? And he said that Engdahl's book shows how people hundreds of years ago simplified the alien civilization's question. They assumed that worlds would be inhabited because God wouldn't be wasteful. 
<laughs> I haven't read those, but that's really yeah. interesting. And yeah, there's a whole is. bunch of there's a whole bunch of history that I that I left out that I you know in some in some different talks I talk about where you know the ideas of how religion and science interconnect interconnect with each other around exoplanets are really interesting, right? So you have Giordano Bruno who you know gets burned at the stake for saying that there's other planets because that you know disagrees with religion. Um, hundreds of years before that, uh, there's an an Iranian uh, philosopher. Um, whose name I can't remember, I'm sorry, because I don't have the slide in front of me. Um, and he has this quote where he's, you know, you know, God, the God of the, this religion is the most high and he's the most high of all the worlds. Like it doesn't, you know, he, you know, he has enough power to have a thousand worlds and a thousand suns. Uh, so, you know, this philosopher is very much of the like, God is infinite. So why would there just be one planet around one star? Um, and then you have Newton, Isaac Newton, uh, who was also very religious. And he was, he talked about the idea of exoplanets and he was just like, God is just God of all of them. Like, that's fine. That's, there's no disagreement there. You know? So it's just interesting to see the ideas about religion and exoplanets through the centuries. Um, and, you know, just coming you know, now, I think it's fine. Like, it's just like, yeah, God, if, if, if God is God of earth, then he can be God of all the planets. Uh, Bronwyn asked, uh, has anyone in science fiction created a planet that we now know is almost certainly impossible to exist? I could think of one. <laughs> Let's see if you can think of one. Well, there was, there was an episode of Doctor Who called The Impossible Planet. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was also, I remember watching an episode of Doctor Who where they stole like 11 different planets from in space and time and like put them all in one spot. And it, you know, when it came on the screen, my husband's also an astronomer and we both were like, oh, that's not stable at all. <laughs> so it, was like, it was like 11 planets all just like crammed in together. They were like being held in stasis by, you know, the, the whatever science had brought them there. But it was just like, oh, that doesn't work. No, don't let those go. They're all just going to smash. But I'm interested to know which one you were thinking of. Richard. Oh, the one I was thinking, I was thinking of Interstellar again. And I was thinking about the second planet they went to where the uh, the rocks or these large boulders, some of which were miles in size, were actually floating uh, up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that seemed quite impossible to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was great yeah. CGI on that scene. But it was it was uh, mm -hmm. an absurdly ridiculous notion, mm -hmm. at least to, yeah, to, to, from what I could tell. You'd have to have a very, very dense atmosphere to to have something like that. And mm -hmm. it didn't it didn't seem possible. Right. Actually, one thing I would like to say to Jesse is that uh, on the original Kepler website, there was a picture showing the star field uh, that was observed, and that picture was taken by our former president, East Bay Astronomical Society, Carter Roberts from uh, Barcroft uh, over in the uh, White Mountains at twelve thousand feet. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, obviously, you know, Ames is just down the road from you guys. So I'm not surprised that there'd be connections between you, Kepler and you guys. Yeah. We I was at, to... I was at Ames for four years. Oh, the, oh I actually lived in, that. I lived in Oakland. I lived near the Rockridge Bart. This is my <laughs> old haunt. Yeah, your old uh, stopping grounds. Exactly. Yeah, as, yeah. as I mentioned to you in my email, I remember seeing Gibor Basri uh, mm -hmm. in the physics library at Stanford when, when we were both there together. Uh, ah, cool. It's a very small world. Yes. He's still at Berkeley, I think. Yeah. Yes, he is. I think he has an administrative title now. Okay. All right. Here's another. Michael pointed out uh, the planet from the first men in the moon. The ship Kavor built looks like the coronavirus, and the moon men were wiped out by a virus brought from Earth. <laughs> well, that's a timely... Uh... <laughs> That's a timely uh, comparison. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. What, Any other questions? Can you tell comments? me the title of that again, Richard? Oh, that was the first men in the moon. The um, okay. I, I I remember it being a, 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 a both a book and a, and there's a movie too that was made from it. If I remember correctly, it's been Ever. a while. Yeah. All right. Anything else from anyone? No. Well, you're going to make me start reading more science fiction again. <laughs> that's that. That's the result of this talk. I've been well, reading that's like the all. Well, if that's takeaway, then yeah. that's great. It is great. I, I need to get back to that. I've been reading only uh, uh, nonfiction for the last uh, two years, and it's uh, it's time to to start reading about weird planets again. There's a lot so. of great sci-fi books that have come out in the last five years. Yep. One all right, the, uh, Richard. One other thing I wanted to just mention. Oh, go ahead. But I got yeah, the idea got to get Jesse from my wife. 
So I'd like to give a shout out to her. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for having us have a wonderful speaker. Jesse, that was very entertaining. Oh, no worries. It really was. Thank you for having me. Thank you me. so much. Yay. Sure. And best of luck to you and uh, take good care of your TARDIS there. And can we ha <laughs> Jesse, can we have you back? Can you discover more planets, please? Absolutely. And when we can travel again, I'm up in the Bay Area for to visit Kepler and my you know, colleagues there regularly. So uh, I'll try and see if I can coincide and actually come visit. We would love to have you. Yeah, that would be, that would really be great because we have a, a really nice facility. And if you've never been up to Chabot, we have some beautiful historical telescopes that are uh, in use every weekend. Uh, yeah, that'd when be we're wonderful. Open to the public, so you can follow in yeah, good just... footsteps. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's wonderful. That's so cool. All, all right. Thanks, well, take guys. care, and thank you all for joining us tonight. And we will see you next month. And uh, for those who are interested. Uh, we have virtual telescope viewing tonight at 930. Of course, it'll be a virtual, virtual program because we're at 97% humidity and uh, completely fogged in. So we'll probably be talking about the eclipse and various other things. So uh, have a nice uh, uh, long weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Good night.